So we should mute now? Yes, please. And then I'll let you know when I let participants in. Okay. We are live. I'm letting people in. Hey. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Expert Collective, um, where Tommy and I will be guiding you guys through the presentation today. Um, so I'm Josiah and um, Tommy. I'm Tommy. Yeah. Uh, Tommy and I will be guiding you guys through the presentation today. Um, so I'm Josiah. And then, so today is the expert talks. Before we get started, we would like you guys to know that if you need any captions while we're present, then please let us know. It should show at the bottom of your screen here for live captions, and you can request that. And if you have any questions, please send a message in the chat to our moderators. Um, and moderator should be within the name, or you could just uh, chat with Tommy as well. Um, and now I'll go into our land acknowledgement. So we acknowledge that what we call Alberta is the traditional and ancestral territory of many people, presently subject to Treaty 6, 7, and 8, namely the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Kainai, the Pikani and Six Sika, the Cree, Dene, Soto, Nakoda So, Stony Nakoda, and the Sutina Nation, and the Métis people of Alberta. This includes the Métis settlements and the six regions of the Métis Nation of Alberta within the historical Northwest Métis homeland. We acknowledge that the many First Nations, Métis and Inuit who have lived in and cared for these lands for generations. We're grateful for the traditional knowledge keepers and elders who are still with us today and those who have gone before us. We make this acknowledgement as an act of reconciliation and gratitude to those whose territory we reside on or are visiting. And so, so uh, we're excited to spend the night with you guys and learn from our invited guests. But before anything else, tell me what can we expect from the expert talks? Thank you, Josiah. Well, expert talks is brought to you by the Expert Collective where every month we will be inviting professionals from various fields to discuss different topics about immigration and Canadian and student life. Yeah. 
That's very interesting. And uh, just to give everyone the idea about the Expert Collective, also known as TEC or Tech, it's a non-for-profit organization based in Calgary. Alberta serving underrepresented newcomers, Canadian youth, aspiring immigrants and international students and third party providers. For our episode today, we're going to discuss different immigration pathways to Canada. We invited immigration consultants from Alberta to give their insights and answer some frequently asked questions about the topic. Yeah, and after the panel discussion, we're going to have a 30 minute question and answer portion where you can ask your personal questions to our RCICs. So just to all our attendees, to avoid any interruptions during the panel discussion, please make sure to mute your audio when not speaking. And if you do have any questions, please type them in the chat box and our moderator or me will be the one to take note for later. So let's begin. Our first panelist initially worked as a registered social worker for 16 years in her home country, the Philippines, and later on in Canada. In 2011, she became a regulated Canadian immigrant consultant, RCIC, and founded her own immigration and employment firm, L3J Immigration Consulting Incorporation. Now let's all welcome Lisa DeLeon. Hi everyone, so it's nice to meet you all here. It's our first expert talks and I, we're so excited to have at least more than 50 registrants today. So we're gonna have more in our next talks. Thank you everyone. And Tommy? Yes. Thank you so much, Lisa. Our second panelist is a regulated Canadian immigration consultant, or ICIC, and founder of the MCN Canada Immigration Consulting Incorporated. For 10 years, she has practiced and assisted people from other cultures reunite with their families and establishing them in Canada. She is actively involved within her community and in the Filipino Association in Edmonton, Alberta. Let us all welcome Marjorie Newman, Thank you. Uh, thank you very much to me for the kind introduction. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizer of this webinar, Expert Talks, the Expert Collective, for giving me the opportunity to be part of this event. It is an honor and a privilege to, to join two of my colleagues, uh, Lisa and uh, Joseph. I'm excited and I can assure you that this, this will be an interesting discussion and that you will learn a lot of things and takeaways after this session. Uh, just a disclaimer, you don't need a representative to submit an application with Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada or IRCC, but if you decide to hire one, please make sure that the immigration consultant is licensed and in good standing with CICC. If you are not familiar with the immigration process, the regulations, the act and policies, we are here for you. A simple or a minor mistake in your application could pose a risk in your application. Various problems might arise and you're alone in resolving these issues. A simple error in your application could lead to even rejection, loss of status in Canada, and might lead to a removal. So just remember, we're here for you. You're not alone. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. And now our last panelist is a regulated Canadian immigration consultant in good standing and the founder of the firm Soriano Immigration Consulting Incorporation. Originally from the Philippines, he came to Canada in 2013 as a temporary foreign worker. The economic downturn in 2015 has left a lot of foreign workers unemployed. So he then decided to become an international student in 2015 and studied business administration at Bow Valley College to further establish himself in Canada. That's all welcome, Joseph Soriano. Uh, good day, everyone. Thank you, Jess, for the introduction. Um, thank you, uh, uh, the Expert Collective, for having me and for inviting me in, uh, as part of the panelists for this evening. Uh, thank you also for everyone who's attending this webinar. I hope you all find um, this very informative and valuable for yourself and also for your family or friends who may be interested to immigrate here. I hope um, you'll be able to share what you'd be 
learning from um, from this evening or from this morning, wherever you are. And we look forward to interacting with you later on uh, with your questions. And yes, I hope you all have a great um, time and we look forward to helping you. That's all, thank you. Thank you so much, Joseph. And thank you to our two other panelists. Now let's proceed to our discussion. So just to remind you all again, please make sure to mute your audio. And if you have any questions, please type them in the Zoom chat box and we will make sure to add it in later. So our first question is, what are the most popular or ideal pathways to take this year? So maybe for the host, if we could unmute ourselves and let's start with a discussion. But uh, for the host, would you mind to allow me to just uh, uh, provide a little more details of what the expert collective is? It's because I don't want our audience to be like wondering why we are the expert collective. And so just uh, if it's okay, I'm just going to give you a little summary. It's a very lo like long material, but well, I'll try to make it like as quick as I can. So I would suggest maybe I'll just be sharing it from my end because I think I can share it from my end. So I'll, I'll do that from my end. Um, I'll share my screen with you. Let me see again, so I'm kind of, let me see again. So share screen, share. Okay, so can everyone see my screen? You can see my screen too, Jess, everybody? Okay, so let me just introduce you uh, what the Expert Collective is. So this is uh, what the Expert Collective is. Um, we founded this organization in 2020. It is an, a collective effort and it's a not-for-profit organization, just like what Josiah has mentioned. And it comprises of a team of diverse professionals who have been in the business for many de decades. Uh, it's not all, just all about immigration. It's uh, about can Canada life, student life, immigration, all these things. So we came together as professionals. So we have like lawyers, we have accountants, we have regulated immigration consultants in this organization who affiliated with us so that we can work, like we can provide a one-stop shop service. Uh, in our experience, when clients come to us and they have trust in us, they usually ask us for information for other things. And so we came together so that we can all provide it all in one uh, platform. So that's what the expert collective is again the objective of this project of this organization is just is to deliver um, a collaborative framework of collaborative services to our clients. So this is our timeline. We like people who are engaged or involved in this organization for the founders. Uh, we came here in two thousand to two thousand fourteen. So this is when the founders uh, came to Canada. So we came together, there were like four or five of us when we started it. And uh, this is during the pandemic time. Uh, this has been the, like the, the concept for a decade, for a very long time, but it didn't happen because when we started our business as immigration consultants, uh, we, we didn't have time to do some other things. But then when pandemic happened, somehow pandemic has also given us the opportunity to realize what we have like uh, thought or what we have planned to do. Um, so in 20, November 2018, we registered the business and we started as a private organization. And in uh, December 29, 2020, we we're able to, to do the soft launch and there were already 32 people who believe in our concept. So in March 2021, we started applying for funding and the government has granted, approved our applications. We provide services to the three organizations, the Expert Collective, Outreach Immigration, and Supreme Hoops Canada. So we applied for the Canada Summer Jobs Program. And this is the reason why we have all, like the all employees of the Expert Collective right now are all students and new graduates. Um, if you can see the organizers, Josiah, um, Maria, Tommy, 
Anna, everyone, they're all students and new graduates. So we wanna give that opportunity to them because we know we believe that they have so much potential to share with us. So in April, 2021, uh, that is the duration of the CSJ program. So we, they, uh, it's still on right now, and that's why they're still here because the program runs from April 2021 to February 2022. Again, this is funded by the, the Canadian government, uh, hiring this uh, youth who are like really uh, very, like have very strong potentials. And in August 2021, we applied for the SSLP, like it's a grant application for students, and we developed the For the Love of Youth project. So we're still waiting for decisions on our applications. And in August 18, we registered the business as a not-for-profit organization. It's because we need support from the government. And really the concept is like to come together and work together. Um, so we applied for this, like red application call for proposal. Uh, in September, we registered in Alberta again as a provincial, extra provincial corporation in Canada. And uh, supposedly we were going to do the official launch of the expert collective. However, because of the like surge of COVID-19 again, we postponed it. But one of these days, we're gonna invite everyone again to uh, attend the, officials, the official launch of the expert collective. So this is our five-year plan. Uh, the first two years would be the implementation of the uh, like the fly project, and we will now reach out internationally. We're going to have more events like this. We are going to reach out universities. It's because we want to introduce the licensed practitioners only. We know that a lot of people are doing this job, doing immigration job without the license. We have to let the market know that people know that when you enter into providing services about immigration, you have to be licensed. You cannot just get someone to help you out and not licensed at all. It's, it's um, illegal in Canada. And if anyone is providing services without being licensed, the government or our college is now running after them. Okay, so we wanna let the people know about it. Um, so we wanna like, uh, we plan to open up or register our organization, the Expert Collective, collective expanded in the Philippines, in Australia, and uh, any countries that is interested in adopting this concept. So this is our ongoing projects right now. We're still waiting for the government to get back to us and hopefully they're gonna grant our request so that we can do some more things for, for, the, for the exploited people, like people that are uh, susceptible to immigration exploitation. And so these are the applications that we have submitted and are awaiting decisions. And this is for the Love of Youth project that we have, the ongoing projects we have. This is our, this is the reason why we, we came with the, for the Love of Youth, it's because the majority of the people, the, like the, that is affect, affected or the sector that has been affected by this pandemic are the youth. And so we wanna provide more services to the youth that could help all the business affiliates and also reach out to our target market, which is the, the vulnerable people who are like, like people in the Philippines particularly, who just sell anything just to come to or to go to abroad without realizing what the effects or the effects of coming to Canada or being represented by people who are not licensed. So we wanna target those, uh, that, that market. And this is all our plans in, in implementing our uh, for the Love of Youth project, we want to focus on the academic persistence, comprehensive mentorship, building educational aspirations and resiliency. So for the youth right now, the CSJ participants that are part of the expert collective, these people are like really very willing to learn how to run businesses. And like for people, business affiliates that have already been in the business, they will be uh, transferring their skills, their knowledge, their experience of how to operate a business. So this is uh, one of the objectives of doing the, uh, like for the love of youth. And this is our like uh, planned activities. We're gonna, we're, we hope to implement that this year, starting this year. And this is our project framework. We're gonna have the fly hub here in, the, in Calgary, Canada. We will reach out to the high school, college, university students and the new graduates with the help of the business affiliates, companies and not-for-profits. And we target 1000 youth to be like the beneficiaries of this 
uh, initiative, and this is our our like uh, objectives for each of the project. Um, and this is our organizational chart. This is, we have the directors and all other like people working for the organization. Um, so this is again, this is our target market. We want to help Canadians landed immigrants to uh, provide, like we want to provide them with the services, and with the help of the third party providers like myself, like Marjorie and Joey, and also reach out to the foreign nationals and provide education or write information to them. Um, so why we did we do this? It's because me as an immigrant to Canada, when I started here, when I came in 2000, I thought the expectations, the expectations of the immigrants is that when you come to Canada or come to another country, it's like already heaven, right? Without realizing that you will have to go through hurdles, challenges in, in integrating into the, the new country like Canada. So when you come to Canada, the immigration system is looking for these factors for you to be, to be accepted to enter to Canada. But then when you're already here, you have the experience, you have the profession, you are licensed in your country. But when you get to Canada, there is problem again, you're gonna face the problem. It's because the Canadian labor market would just not welcome you. You need to have this set of uh, factors for you to be able to integrate into the Canadian labor market. So there's another parameters. So there's gap between the Canadian labor markets, Canadian immigration system and the Canadian labor market. And why we came up with the tech uh, organization because our objective is to bridge the gap between the two. There's a lot of gaps between like the immigration system and the Canadian labor market, and we want to help some of, somehow bridge that gap. So, the, and how are we going to do this? We this is our values. Like most of us, all of us who are part of the expert collective, the business affiliates, adapt to these values. So we want to be as transparent as we can. So we want to be honest in advising our clients. We want to provide our clients with the best informed decision-making choices. We want to empower everyone. And uh, to empower everyone, again, when you come to Canada, you start from zero. So you get discouraged because you cannot find work. Uh, you, ended, you end into like working in the like food services industry or retail trade service industry. You shouldn't be discouraged because now we're here to somehow support and help those people who would be starting their life lives in Canada. And how are we going to do this? We do this through our connections, through our connectivity, because there are other business affiliates who are part of our organization who can somehow help in placing employment to the newcomers, to the international students. So that's our like objectives. So. And what drives us in doing this? This is our vision. We want to build a global network of experts. And it's not just about immigration. It's about all like different, uh, like the diverse fields, the different practices, different professionals. So, and our mission is to bridge, again, I've mentioned that, to bridge the Canadian immigration system and Canadian labor market gaps and make it accessible to our clients through our unified stakeholders holistic service approach. And our goal is to help a global market of unprotected individuals achieve the life they deserve in can the life they deserve. And what are the services that we are offering? Again, through our uh, collaborative framework uh, with like different professionals, we offer student solutions, uh, we offer employment solutions, immigration solutions, legal solutions. These are the available solutions we have because we have lawyers who are part of the organization. We have accountants who are part of the organization. And we have like a child health and child care providers who are part of the organization. We have a doctor who is like actively participating or involved in our organization as well. So we also offer business solutions the expert collective is providing like services in registering businesses. So for like new immigrants who have inclination to doing business, we want to help them build their business. We want to help them with registering their business. 
we want to help them with applying for like LMIA. So we have like clients, for example, like Joseph, uh, one of our panelists, uh, in his introduction, he came here as a worker, but then he faced so many challenges. He switched his status from being a worker to a student. And after studying, he applied to become a permanent resident. So after becoming a permanent resident, he built his own business as well. Where did he learn this? He learned it through connections. He learned it through being our colleagues. Like we are here to support each other. So now with that, they become like business owners, business affiliates, they might need worker to uh, work for their organizations. And that's how we're gonna help them with hiring foreign workers or uh, doing the LMIA applications. And we also provide IT solutions. So we have an IT specialist who is like really uh, good at doing IT, like providing IT services. And again, this is the founders are the founders. These are the people who supported my idea, the concept of, of coming together. Um, the business affiliates we have, I, and I wanna show that to you so that you know who we are. So we have like, again, we are like, I think we have like 77 people right now who are part of the organizations as business affiliates and professionals. So these are the people in Calgary. These are the people in Edmonton and we have people in Grand Prairie. Uh, people in Saskatchewan, British Columbia, Columbia, Toronto, and USA. Um, this is the these are the not-for-profit organizations that have affiliated with us. And for me, like some people asked or like new people who I have reached out, they said, "Oh, I don't want to be part of the expert collective because I am not an expert yet." Uh, for me, I made the statement that claiming that you are an expert is not an overstatement. We can all be experts. You can become an expert when you have well-informed well decision-making choices, and you are an expert when you impart your extensive knowledge and skills with dedication and passion. You don't have to be perfect in what you're doing, right, to become an expert. If you have that experience already, you can, you can be an expert. And the more you share your knowledge, the more you share your experience, it makes you become experts. But if you just keep it to yourself, like your knowledge and experience, you're not willing to share it. I, I think, yes, you don't have that comfort level or you're not confident to claim as an expert. It's about sharing your expertise. It's about sharing your knowledge and, and experience for you to be called an expert or claim yourself as an expert. So these are our, co our core team and our CSJ participants who help us realize this organization. These are our core team. So you have Desiah, Anna, and Shannon there. Shannon, if you are following our social media promotions, Sharon, Shannon is the one doing all the like postings, the signing and everything. And she's like really good at doing that. And she's from the University of Calgary. And uh, Anna is the one helping us with uh, like all of our like write-ups and everything. And also Desiah helps us with the like doing all the research for us. Core team again, Tommy and Lance are, are, are helping us. Uh, for LTJ team who are part of the um, Canada Summer Job, we have Bea, our moderator, our overall host. We have Pamela and we have Chang and all other people that contributed to the expert collective. So we have them. And for the organization that have, we have supported in applying for the Canada Summer Job program, uh, we have Supreme Hoops Canada and they have like 70 CSJ participants. So that's that. And this is what um, the not-for-profit registration is ongoing right now. We assisted Daddy Goose in applying for federal and extra-provincial registration. We assisted Willet Basketball Foundation in their federal registration. We ass assisted in specs tutoring. So again, we, we are not gonna be able to realize all of our plans if we don't have people helping us out. So we have specs tutoring who is expert in, in providing tutoring services. And these are our grant applications that are ongoing right now and we're awaiting decisions. So thank you again for this time. I know I am using lots of time for this like discussion so again we want to welcome everybody in this discussion thank you Tommy. thank you desire for giving me this chance to to at least introduce the expert collective to everyone and back to you 
Tommy and Desaya. Yes, thank you so much for sharing, Lisa. So I hope everyone has a better idea of what the Expert Collective is and what our goals and missions are. So we'll get into the main discussion now. For the first question, we have it on the screen there. It is, what are the most popular or ideal pathways to take this year? So maybe we're gonna uh, let Marjorie start first with the discussion. All right, uh, thank you for that introduction, uh, Alisa, about Expert Collective. And uh, I really admire how uh, Joseph, you know, entered Canada, then uh, became a, you know, far as a worker, and then uh, applied for permanent residence through the student pathway. So very impressive. And now you're a business owner, <laughs> and you're thank one you, of thank us. You. Oh, so <laughs> okay. Such so my take, on, <laughs> my take on that is, um, I think it's obvious it will be the study permit category. And this has been em emphasized under the prime minister's mandate letter to immigration. Uh, it's because international students, they're significant and they're growing uh, contributor to the economy. Uh, as per immigration, over 61% increase in study permits were issued between 2015 and 2019. And then Canada ranked fourth in study destinations in 2019, up from seventh in 2015. And just imagine PGWP holders have increased from 55,581 in 2016 to 221,011 in 2020. And then top five country source of international students, India, China, Republic of Korea, France, Iran, and Philippines. And then I believe the second would be the provincial nominee program. Uh, this is the only program that has been inviting candidates in the express entry pool since September 15, 2021. And as of 2019, 68,647 people were selected under the PNP. And the PNP accounted for 53,960 landings last year. And then maybe the third, not sure if the unemployment will continue to increase. Temporary foreign worker program, it's still there. In 2021, Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada focused on transitioning as many temporary residents who were already in Canada to permanent residents in order to meet its target. IRCC felt that this was the most effective way to achieve its target amid COVID-19 travel restrictions and other pandemic-related challenges. And if you remember, uh, was it on February where they were they they sent like 27 or they invited 27,000 applicants for permanent residence under the CEC. And also, if you remember, if you recall, in May, was it May? Uh, IRCC launched six immigration streams now in an effort to land like 90,000 international students and temporary foreign workers uh, living in Canada. So it will be international students, PNP, uh, maybe uh, uh, temporary uh, pathways for temporary foreign workers program and uh, express entry. Thank you. So, and to add to that, uh, to address the question as well, what is the best immigration pathway right now? So, if you know, if you look at the inventory, the rounds of invitation, there are no invitations for federal skilled worker program. And these are more, most of the invitations are coming from provincial nomination. Like, and there's no, starting September as well of last year up to now, there is no Canadian experience class uh, rounds of invitation. So what I, I suggest or what I recommend to do for people who are outside of Canada, overseas people, you cannot come to Canada through the Express Entry Program if we're gonna base it off from the data. Mm -hmm. It's because there are no selections for people coming outside of Canada. So the best option is to maybe somehow come here either as a worker or a student. And that way you can become competitive in the expert entry pool and somehow apply for provincial nominations when you are already in Canada. Anything I just want, add? yeah, go ahead. yeah, I just have to add. Um, so I think um, 
since we've mentioned express entry and um, temporary residence applications, I think uh, the one of the big takeaways from what I've been hearing from from uh, prospect clients or those who are reading about what um, programs are available, um, a lot of people are being um, encouraged or um, to prioritize or even pay right away to get um, express entry profiles prioritized or lodged in rather than encouraging um, or put to consider um, planning to apply for either um, studying here or maybe looking for a job offer to come here as a worker. So just a takeaway from that, I guess, is um, yeah, the way the, the, the landscape, the immigration landscape is shifting, um, you got to prioritize, like Ms. Lisa said, um, exploring how to come here temporarily as a student or as a worker. And then um, at the same time, uh, working on becoming more competitive um, when lodging in an excess entry profile in the future. So just something to add on to that. Uh, Lisa, sorry. Yes, go ahead, Marjorie. Um, remember there was a, um, a memo that was obtained by an immigration lawyer, Stephen Murins, mm -hmm. an IRCC internal memo in connection with uh, Joseph's um, discussion um, that there is a pause. They're not going to send or to invite applicants under the FSH program, you know, Federal Skilled Worker, Federal Skilled Trades, and CEC. So if, even if you have a profile there, uh, in fact, the Minister of Immigration uh, admitted that it might take a while before they're going to invite applicants on the express entry pool. It's because they already have enough inventory for this year. All mm -hmm. right. Yes. So there, there might be a pause for people coming. So if you are, if anyone of here joining the, this discussion and you are from outside of Canada and you're planning to apply for permanent residency, yes, you are more than welcome to enter your uh, express entry profile. But again, basing off from the data or from the information provided by the IRCC, they have enough inventory for just the people for people who are already inside Canada. In fact, last year, um, maybe like everybody know, everybody knew that there was a TR to PR pathway where the immigration or IRCC has only invited people who have already worked here in Canada. So again, the best pathway if you are from outside Canada is maybe explore the option of coming here as a worker or explore the option of coming as a student and then eventually apply for permanent residency in Canada. Okay, so maybe we're going to move on to the next question, uh, Tommy. Thank you, panelists, for your topics on that uh, popular and ideal pathways to take this year. Uh, now we're going to go into the next question here. I'll share my screen. Um, what are the key factors to consider when applying, such as like what if you missed a document or what if their online portals don't work? So maybe Marjorie can start as well. Okay, so, <laughs> I, okay, thank you. Um, key factors to consider when applying, um, eligibility of the applicant, okay? Um, maybe most of the immigration categories, yeah, you have to be eligible, right? And then you might consider inadmissibility like your security, criminal, medical. You might have uh, misrepresentation, previous applications or refusals with immigration and other countries, documents required in the application. You straighten all your facts and then identification of documents and then assessment of the best uh, immigration option for you. So let's just take, for example, for a sponsorship application, because I do a lot of sponsorship application, not by choice. It's just so happened that most of the clients, you know, approached me uh, if I could represent them in their uh, sponsorship application. So like uh, for this type of uh, category or application, eligibility, I have to uh, assess if the sponsor is eligible, right? I have to assess the genuineness of the relationship. 
if there's inadmissibility issues, uh, how the relationship develop, then you start gathering the information like financial support, proof of money transfer, ongoing communication, employment or work insurance, letters of support from friends and families, the gifts that you're given to each other, proof of visits by the sponsor, social media presence, your pictures, ongoing communication, proof of continuous cohabitation documents, right? And of course, submitting the complete application package is very important. So those are like important factors uh, uh, to consider when applying or submitting an application. So I'm going to speak about experts entry, just like Marjorie, we don't choose, we didn't choose our expertise. This is that like, it's just because it's for some reasons, this is the volume of clients that we have. So I do a lot of express entry applications and LMA applications. So my practice is like really supporting employers, supporting colleagues, doing uh, co-counseling, mentoring. So I do a lot of LMA applications. And when we do a lot of LMA applications, it leads to doing work permit and express entry applications. So mostly when I do work permit applications, it's tied to express entry because the LMA applications that I do for them is called dual intent. So it's applying for a work permit with the intention to apply to become permanent resident. And this pathway is connected to the express entry program. So this is what I was talking about. Maybe explore the option of coming as a worker, but uh, looking at the what eligibility criteria or what to look at in terms of applying is that you need to have everything ready. If you're really planning to come to Canada, you have to have your education assessed already. And that assessment, it's called educational credential assessment, is valid for five years. So you need to have that done immediately or right away. And you also have to like uh, get ready of having your English language um, uh, tests or like go for the English language exams to test your English language ability because that is one major requirement in applying for an express entry. So when I do a work permit, I assess my clients under the eligibility of what we have discussed about federal express entry, federal skilled trade and Canadian experience class. So uh, you have to get ready of all those documents. Police certificates, I don't advise them securing it right now because it's expired like right away it expires in one year time. Medical certificates, you don't, that, don't get that right now because it expires within one year as well. So those two things are very important, the educational assessments and the English language ability. So get ready of that. So if you are going to contact any one of us, either Marjorie, uh, Joseph or myself, um, it's, it's nice to have those things ready already. Uh uh, Lisa, okay. just to quick, sorry, sorry, Joey. For those who do not know about the LMIA, like in most cases, you need, especially coming from the Philippines, you need an LMIA to be able to apply for a work permit. Correct. So it's it's called labor market impact assessments. Um, I can see a lot of uh, client, uh, people joining this event. Uh, some or maybe most are my clients, so they're familiar of what we're talking about. So when you do and we, when we do an individual, this the reason why our questions are very general. It's to provide you the general idea of what immigration Canadian immigration system is. But if you have like specific uh, questions, or we we can give advice specifically to you or customize to your need. But you need to like contact us, like either Marjorie, myself, or Joey, or, or Joseph, so that we can provide you with the most effective pathway according to your eligibility or according to your qualifications. So I'm just going to add to, or even repeat some of uh, what we've mentioned already about the pathways. The pathways. So pretty much in general, I think you've seen in the screen, there were three items shown, sponsorship, express entry, and last one was study permit. So uh, there was an example. So for the first two um, items, sponsorship and express entry, just to repeat, are the permanent residence uh, program. So once you apply for those and you qualify and you've been approved, then you come here as a permanent resident. Now I'm going to talk more about um, student permit, study permit or 
temporary residence um, applications. Just to um, go back full circle to what we mentioned earlier. Um, so, um, so what if a um, person is not, just wants to come here to Canada temporarily? So not everyone, um, programs are not just available to come here permanently. There are also tempor um, applic applications where you can just uh, apply if you want to stay temporarily in Canada. For example, if you just want to study or work or just visit um, for a, um, a definite period of time. Or um, maybe you don't qualify for one of those uh, permanent residence applications. So sponsorship in general, you're normally able to apply for PR if, for sponsorship if um, you have relatives or an eligible sponsor who can support your application. What if you don't? Or if, like we mentioned earlier, express entry um, so far, the government of Canada or Immigration Canada is not currently um, inviting people to apply for PR if, for example, they are currently outside Canada or they haven't uh, acquired any um, Canadian education or Canadian work experience. So if those are the, the, the scenarios, um, what can someone who's interested to come here instead consider as an immigration pathway? So it gives way to, um, that's, uh, to, the, to the rational on why um, people should consider applying for uh, TR or temporary residence, such as applying for a study permit, work permit. So these applications, um, the importance of this is if you're successful to come here temporarily, it may open doors or opportunities to eventually apply for permanent residence. So for example, for work permits, uh, in, in general, you'd need a valid job offer. Usually a valid job offer must be supported by a labor market impact assessment. There are other more um, uh, um, kinds of work permits, but that's the most uh, common. If um, a foreign national is successful to apply for a work permit with a valid job offer, um, he or she will be able to um, acquire Canadian work experience in Canada. Um, same thing with the study. Um, if someone who applying for a study permit, if he or she is successful to um, get admitted to a school, complete um, uh, eligible studies in Canada, he or she may also, after graduating, apply for postgrad work permit and acquire Canadian work experience in Canada. So the importance of this is um, how gaining the Canadian work experience in Canada is essential in order to qualify or eventually become eligible to apply for permanent residence programs such as Express Entry and PNP. So um, I just want to share that to give more context as to why, um, uh, what's the importance of also considering temporary residence applications, especially during this time when most permanent residence applications are limited to certain um, profiles such as those who are already in Canada. So I hope, I think um, Tech will be also um, hosting um, more webinars in the future to discuss more on these temporary residence uh, applications, which I think, um, I guess would be um, an inter the, the next interesting topics for most um, attendees later on. Yes. So the next time around, we're going to do when we do the like post events like this, we're going to do a little survey to get the interest of the participants, uh, whether what kind of topic they would like to discuss. Because like, again, like we are a group of experts who can deliver different uh, expertise. So um, we're going to solicit from our participants in the next time to be specific, like to make our our talks specific to their needs, mm -hmm. tailored to their needs. So shall we move on to the next question, um, Jez? Yeah. yeah. Or Tommy? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, thank you so much for sharing. Questions. Yeah, thank you guys for sharing. We just had um, a, like a follow-up question for you guys. Um, and it was just like, uh, you guys were speaking about how English proficiency was great and well needed, especially when coming here for work. Um, are there other extra documents that would be helpful to strengthen the applications, however, if you guys have any in mind? 
So it depends on the type of application that the applicant or that applicant is applying for. Because every, every program or every stream the applicant is uh, considering to apply has its own document checklist, has its own instruction guide. So we would be able to further discuss that if uh, we can discuss with an individual person and assess the, the need of that person, okay? But generally, again, you get ready of your English language, you get ready of your big educational credentials, get ready of your employment references, and you make sure that whatever you declared on your resume is genuine, it's legitimate, it's supported by evidence. You cannot just say anything, like declare anything on your resume or say something in your employment history without being supported by evidence. I know in many countries we are not used to, like some people are working or being paid by cash, that's not gonna be considered by the government. They don't just rely on your declaration that you work for this company or you did this without the evidence. So you have to get rid of those. Those are the important things to, to remember as well, like with the employment references. So you're muted, Jess. And Tomi. I think you're Tomi muted, Tomi, sorry. Yeah, yeah, she's muted. muted. Oh no. Okay, I'm not unmuted. I was just thanking you for answering the follow-up question. Um, we have another question here. So what would increase the odds of one's application and what would help an application stand out amongst others? Do you wanna start off Marge or Joey? Joey can start. I will <laughs> this start time. this time. <laughs> this time. Okay. <laughs> so what can make an application stand out? Well, I think just for um, this discussion, I think what's more important is uh, what would make sure or what would increase the odds of an application to be accepted and for an application to be deemed um, um, eligible or for the best odds that an application would have the, be the best possible outcome. So I guess my thoughts on that would be um, it would start mainly on an applicant to make sure that he or she had done um, um, the research um, first of all, um, regardless whether the applicant intends to do to launch an application um, themselves or with the help of a of a consult of counsel and consultant or an immigration lawyer. So, like how we just mentioned earlier, there are plenty of um, immigration programs, and we mentioned key factors um, to uh, to consider. Such um, so mainly, you have to make sure that um, you'd be able to. Um, apply or you are eligible first to apply for that particular program because if you're not well informed or you don't understand um, the different programs and you somehow um, select out of um, you know um, out of rant or without with the lack of understanding and you didn't know that you actually you don't actually qualify for the application regardless of how much effort you put into that application if you don't meet the requirements how much is, it doesn't matter how much you stand out, um, you will not get a, a positive outcome on that application. So I guess, um, yeah, that's my first tip is to make sure you do your research first. If you're not sure, or even if you clearly understand um, your research, uh, it would still be advisable to consider engaging in a, at least in a consultation with one of uh, us um, immigration consultants. If you don't understand, then at least somewhat one of us can um, provide the detailed um, assessment and give you all the detailed information. Or even if you do understand, at least um, you'll be able to, if you're well researched already, you'll be able to craft um, a more structured set of questions uh, that's more relatable to your situation. And that would help the consultant also to be more effective in, uh, in doing an assessment. And most of your questions would also be uh, uh, around verifying whether they truly understand what they've actually read and to confirm whether your understanding, for example, if whether you, you the application you're looking at um, is somewhat doable, if you're eligible or not, then we can confirm and tell you, yes, I think you can 
apply for that. These are the requirements. Would you like some help? Would you like to do it on your own? But regardless, um, having that confirmation, having that um, um, research would help increase your odds because somewhat you are more confident or you have that informed decision that you know that whatever application or pathway you're trying to pursue, um, you are eligible and you are on the path to success. Anything to add, Marge? Oh, yes. Thank you. So in addition, um, the key, what would increase the odds of one's application? What will make an application stand out? Uh, preparation is the key. So, and how do you prepare? Uh, in order to submit a complete application package. So uh, just take, for example, with uh, Express Entry, Federal Skilled Worker, Federal Skilled Trades, and CEC. If the application is incomplete, they will reject it as incomplete. And it hurts, right? Because you were already expecting, you already <laughs> hoping. So that's why the key, very important, submit. I cannot emphasize it. Submit a complete application package. For example, in a study permit application, aside from going to the documents checklist and the country-specific documents checklist, like the financially stable students, right, will be better off than you know if the money is not enough to support your application. The student's background matches the selected program. Educational background in the home country. Your English language skills. Student's background matches with the selected program the level of the education of the student. And uh, I also, uh, I'm very careful with also with the study plan. So a realistic, reasonable, and make sense. Something that may, will make sense to the officer, a well-prepared study plan. And then, you know, uh, payment of the tuition fees, like if it's for under the SDS, the GIC, uh, add, uh, and then, you have to be honest with the application, address previous visa refusals. And then, and very important for study permit application, common sense again, you know, with, and on the part of the immigration officer, I always ask this to each client that I met, does the applicant fit the normal profile of a student? Because if the applicant doesn't fit in that normal profile, you. I have to have a lot of explanation in the submission and in the, in, in the study plan to make it you know, uh, with common sense with the officer. So because I always believe, does it make sense? Because if it doesn't make sense to me as your representative, it will not make sense to the officer. And the study plan must uh, address how will the student use the Canadian educational credential? how the, the, the education in Canada uh, will assist them or obtain their career or, or employment when they return home. Strong ties to the home countries, strong ties, uh, ties in Canada, and so on and so forth. So that's just my take on that question. Thank you. Yeah. So to add to Joseph and Marjorie's points, again, Marjorie said the key is preparation and an application that is complete. For um, Joseph's uh, point, uh, you need to, we need to determine the right stream. So Joey mentioned about 20 or even more streams available, like immigration streams. So you have to understand that when we talk about study permit, it's not just a study permit. There are streams for study permits. There is a student direct stream and there is a regular stream. So you, you have to determine, you have to know what is the best stream for you? What is the most successful stream for the many? So for us being the consultants for the longest time, we would be able to determine what is the best stream for the individual client because we've already been doing it. This is our life. We're doing this on a, like a daily basis. But for you as an individual applicant, you might just be able to do your own, like your own research and everything. You, like you might have, I mean, you missed like references maybe of what the effective stream that is best for you. So you have to understand that. And when we talk about work permit, it's not just about work permit. It's LMIA based work permit. It's LMIA exempt based, per, uh, LMIA exempt work permits, there are many streams and there are like IEC, we call IEC, International Experience Canada. That's another stream. People come here under the working holiday program. People come here under the international 
um, or Young Professional Program or if you are from the Philippines, there's a, like a sponsorship of an organization here. You can come for practicum or for an internship if you're a new graduate. So some kind of like that. There are different streams for every program. Study permit, work permit have different streams. Permanent residents have different mm -hmm. streams. Like Marjorie is uh, focusing on sponsorship applications, express entry applications, provincial nomination applications. So there are many streams. It's not just about speaking about permanent residents. And if we are looking at like what the odds are, really, again, it's based on your needs. We're only providing with you with general information. So you have to approach the right person if you need some more help of determining the best pathway for you. So it's just us. There are many more in this organization who can support or who can help out. Mm -hmm. I think I have, we have addressed that uh, question, Jess and Tommy, and uh, proceed to the next question, please. Uh, so I think for time-wise, that's all for the uh, topic answer uh, answering for now. And I think that we can move on to the Q&A. Thank you, expert panelists, for going in depth and in detail about those. By the way, we do have a few questions for you guys. And our moderator, Tomi, can um, just speak upon them. Yes, thank you so much for everyone who's been asking questions on Zoom and on our Facebook. So I have the first question here from Zoom and it says, hello, I would just like to know if, for example, an individual is already here in Canada, may it be study permit or work permit through LMIA, for how long should he or she wait to apply for PR and what pathway is the best? Should it be express entry or PNP? Marge and Joseph, if you want to answer that question. <laughs> Everyone's excited to answer this one. You can go, okay. Miss Marge, no worries. No, you, go, you can go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I'm always going to start with like a basic response. So normally what I... What I would normally advise to, uh, to clients is um, explore both um, pathways and then, which, uh, and then apply to which, whichever comes first. Um, so it's with Express, Express Entry, um, I don't know if we discussed this um, in enough, uh, enough depth uh, to, uh, tonight, but it's, uh, Express Entry is a, a point system. Uh, uh, um, it's a system and you, you have a better chance to be invited to apply for PR if you have um, um, a score that's competitive in the express entry pool. So in order to be competitive and have enough score to be invited for PR, then normally you would need to at least um, acquire one year of skilled work experience in Canada. So for most people, the, the, the minimum timeline to expect uh, if you are able to to be competitive in express entry or more likely the earliest you can apply for PR through that pathway is after a one year of skilled work experience. And then for other pathways like the uh, provincial nomination program, of course, it depends also in, um, in which province you are currently living. I can um, speak or uh, share my, my, um, my experience with Alberta since I'm based here in Calgary. Um, in Alberta, um, in general, if you're, if you're at least as a student, um, if you acquire at least six months of related work experience, for example, um, and you hold a post-grad work permit, and that work experience um, is, you can demonstrate that it's related to your um, completed credential, they may be as early as six months. If, for example, you've graduated, as, you've landed the job as soon as you graduate, maybe you can apply for, for AINP or PNP in Alberta. So it depends on one situation, um, but based on the, ex the ex example I mentioned for this particular scenario, maybe the applicant can consider applying earlier on with PNP and then, but still um, keep um, their options open if maybe they can also apply for express entry 
after a year time when they get the one year uh, Canadian work experience. And then let's see whichever comes first. You're allowed to apply for more than one pathway, but what's more important is being aware that the, these pathways are available, being aware that these are the eligibility criteria and having an idea of um, uh, what to prepare for, uh, what's the soon, uh, what the soonest time that you can apply for one um, pathway and another. So yeah, um, I think to add both. <laughs> Marge? Yes. Oh, I wish I have more information <laughs> because uh, the question is just, uh, you're an international student and then the pathway for permanent residence. So as explained by Joseph, so, and as we mentioned earlier, right? Uh, if we go with Canadian experience class, the IRCC is not uh, doesn't have any plans of uh, sending out invitations. Uh, I don't know for how long, but uh, if you are qualified, you can still create the profile because if you have the profile, you could uh, also be invited by uh, through Alberta Express Entry if you have a, a profile because they they have been sending out uh, invitations to the PNP. And also, uh, if not, uh, if the occupation is uh, low skilled, then you're, you can go with the AINP uh, AOS, provided that the occupation is not on the list of ineligible occupation, and the occupation is also is not on the list of the refusal to process. And then um, for and and also there's so many uh, misinformation because with AINP AOS you have to have completed your program in Alberta, okay? And then, uh, you, yes, that's correct. As Joseph said, you only need a six months work experience, but you still have to go through the, you still have to uh, submit a, a valid like English test. And for uh, NOC, O, A, and B, uh, they require CLB, sub, uh, CLB 5. And for uh, NOC, uh, C, and D, they require CLB 4. And uh, I think you're an international student, so you are not uh, subjected to the, the change in the education. This only, I think, apply, this only applies to the temporary foreign workers. So yeah, for, I wish I have more information, but pathways, let's say, for example, if you're in Alberta, your uh, pathways available for you, you can go with AINP AOS. If then, uh, if it's skilled occupation, you go with the CEC, then you create a profile. Even if we know that, we don't know when IRCC is going to invite applicants, but if you have a profile with IRCC, um, then you have the opportunity, get an invitation, uh, from through Alberta Express Entry. Okay, so my takeaway there is remember the key factor. Do you have a job offer? Whether you're applying under the AOS or you're applying under the Express Entry, it's about the job offer. You are a, a new graduate of from a like an institution here or DLI, and again the key factor as well to determine whether you are qualified or not to apply for permanent residency for whatever pathways you have is that, did you study at the DLI that can confer post-graduation work permit so that you can work and obtain a job offer? So that is a very important key factor, key factor for you to be able to apply for permanent residency, regardless of which province you studied and which province you go to apply for permanent residency, you need to always understand that when you are studying in Canada or you're planning to study in Canada, you are studying at a designated learning institution that can confer a post-graduation work permit so that after graduating or completing your studies, you obtain a work permit and find an employment. So under the Express Entry Program or whether um, the Alberta Opportunity Stream, as long as you have the job offer, you don't need to have the LMIA for you to be eligible to apply for permanent residence. So the very important thing is again, job offer. Alisa, I would like to add to that mm -hmm. job offer thing because uh, just to share my example, um, yesterday I have a consultation with a client. Mm -hmm. She's on a, uh, she's a PGWP. She, uh, she has the job offer, but the problem is when I check the job offer, it says, um, part-time, temporary, and right. casual. Mm -hmm. so remember, okay. even, and then she argued with me that I, I went to see someone and then that I'm qualified because I already have the 12 months work experience. Mm -hmm. So I said, 
uh, okay, but let us go to the policy. Let's go to the regulation, to the mm -hmm. eligibility requirements. If the job offer is uh, temporary, it says temporary, casual, and not full-time, um, seasonal, it doesn't matter how many hours you work. Mm -hmm. you won't qualify and that is a very good point Marge so you have to remember again yes job offer and very good point <laughs> full-time permanent job <laughs> offer yeah. on indeterminate basis okay so when we say about like indeterminate basis at least a minimum of one year full-time permanent job offer mm -hmm. so whether you just started working just like one week ago but the employer is willing to you to give you the job offer it has to be full-time permanent minimum at least one year okay very good points thank you Next all question. so much um so just a reminder we do have a lot of questions coming in so if you can keep the answers brief and concise it would be helpful in, <laughs> okay. in order to okay. get more, I'll do more answers. Talks to accommodate everyone <laughs> we, do, we do appreciate all your experience just so we can answer more questions okay. so i do have a follow-up to that last question um and it is Will an individual be eligible for PR approval if their experience is somehow a combination of hours rendered when they were students, then change status to work permit through LMIA, and then hours rendered under work permit? Okay, I'm gonna, okay, go ahead, March. No, no, go ahead, go ahead, Lisa. Okay, so the person, so the, the case is that the, the students, came to Canada as a student and then switched to uh, obtaining a work permit, but studying at the same time and working full time at the same time. Is that the, I just wanna clarify if that's the case. So even if you're studying, as long as you have a work permit that is LMIA based, that experience while studying is still valid to be counted towards your experience, your work experience, as long as you have the LMIA or the, like the work permit that is based on LMIA or LMA exempt, but not work just mainly on the basis of a study permit. Okay, I hope that is clear. They asked the, our hosts, our moderators are asking us to be like as short and concise as we can. <laughs> and so maybe that answers the question for that specific um, the question. I just want to add that any work experience acquired while you're studying doesn't count for Canadian mm -hmm. work experience class. Okay. Okay, from experience, coming from a student, so the um, you can count work experience um, on the day you submit a postgrad work permit application. Yeah. Anything before that, um, as a student, will not count. Okay, next question. Thank you, guys. We only have like we only have like about fifteen minutes left. We can do it. We can do it. We can so, do it, okay. <laughs> this question um, on Zoom again uh, says, I got my first letter of acceptance from a DLA for, DLI for my client. He has relatives here who will provide for his free board and lodging. His funds will come from his grandmother from the US and they already raised around 15,000 Canadian dollars. Is this enough? And what is the best way to show proof of funds? Can I advise him to open up an account with a Canadian bank? Okay, can I answer before both of you? Go ahead. So it depends on where that client resides right now. If the client resides in the USA, um, you don't need a GIC account. You need to show just proof of funds and be able to uh, pay for the, for the tuition fee. So the requirement is be able to pay for the one full year of tuition fee and have 14,000. Uh, 10,000 for the living expense. So that's the requirement, the basic requirement for a study permit. But if you are in the Philippines or you are in the countries that are under the uh, SDS or piloted countries, for example, under the student direct stream. So the best option is to, if you have the money, because the money is coming from someone else and not from you. So there's really no source of six months of, of funds in your bank. So it's better to go for the, the GIC accounts the Guaranteed Investment um, Certificate account that can be opened up in Canada, but it has to be done with a person from the Philippines or from the country uh, that is eligible for, uh, eligible under the SDS. 
Okay, I'd like to add something. Yeah. Okay, so uh, students are under uh, IRCC's policy, students are required to demonstrate financial sufficiency for only the first year of studies, regardless of the duration of the course or program of studies in which they are enrolled. In other words, a single student entering a four-year degree program with an annual tuition fee of $15,000 must demonstrate funds of $15,000 to satisfy the requirements and not the full $60,000 which should be required for four years. Now, going back to the proof of funds, uh, I sponsored uh, all my nieces and my nephews uh, entered Canada as international students, and then they have no proof of funds, right? Because they just finished college in the Philippines. So I provided the letter of support, being the, the auntie, and then I provided my proof of funds and everything. And then, uh, so I mentioned in my letter of support that I will be responsible. Uh, I, I th all the things that I would be responsible, like for example, their food and accommodation, their uh, tuition fees, uh, all expenses re uh, related to their studies in Canada. Yep. Well, just to add as well. Um, so if someone, if for example, you're, um, you don't have anyone supporting you financially. So um, other than being having the available funds required, as mentioned, um, you also have to prove that. Uh, whatever funds you are showing is um, yours. So you have to show six, at least maybe six, six months back statement minimum. And then I have to show where you earned that funds, maybe through employment or business. Now, if um, in this case where someone is supporting, like a relative, um, like Ms. Marjorie mentioned, she um, ex uh, executed or wrote a, a letter of support. In addition to that, you have to provide um, document so, uh, supporting documentation to establish that there's really a genuine relationship between your supporter and yourself. So, if for example um, you're being supported by a parent, you have to show make sure you include your birth certificate to reflect that um, your parents' name is uh, they're really your parents because it shows on your birth certificate they're your parents. And then um, also um, the same set of documents that you have to prove. Uh, to show if you're applying by your uh, supporting yourself. Um, in this case, um, your supporter should also be prepared to, to share their own uh, proof of um, financial support, either so like their bank statements, um, how they earned that, um, that money. They have to show um, if they, if they earned their employment, they have to also include their confirmation of employment letters, pay stops, and so on and so forth. All right. Perfect. Thank you. So we do have about seven more questions left. Um, our next one is coming from Facebook, and it is about the temporary foreign worker. What is your job hiring? Can I also apply while I'm here in Denmark? And who will be the person contacted? So I will answer that question because I am the one who's licensed as the employment. Because uh, here you can't practice uh, recruitment. You can't do recruitment if you don't have a license to practice as an employment agency. And I believe, yeah, I, I have that license. So in terms of hiring right now, as you can see, everyone is affected by the pandemic, but it looks like the market is going back. It's coming back. It's because they're easing out the restrictions. They're lifting the mask. Uh, restriction and uh, they're, they're removing the um, passport, vaccine passport requirements. So it looks like the market is coming back again. And as, you, as I would like to, or I am happy to, to, to let everyone know that Alberta is going to be a tech um, province of Canada. So they introduced a new program, which is called um, uh, Tech Canada. Pathway to apply for permanent residency. And that program is not gonna, doesn't need to have an LMIA job offer as long as you have the job offer. But my takeaway for that is that you need to be in Canada. It's because I don't think again, the government would let you come to Canada or, or offer you the nomination if you are not in, in Alberta. You need to show that you are going to live in the province of Alberta. So again, best pathway, if there is no chance yet, to apply for permanent residency, yes, come as a student. And if you, the question is who you're going to contact to. So our our moderators and our hosts 
have provided the contact information of each and everyone here, like for the panelists. So you can contact us and somehow if we do have employers for you that is available for you right now, we may be able to place you to unemployment. But again, we panelists cannot give you guarantees that we can provide you with employment. We can only bet or like um, your like resumes, your application, share it to the employers and let the employers choose who they want it. So you have to make sure that your, your resume, that your employment preferences is verifiable. They are verifiable. And during the interview that you can respond to the interview. So again, we will only help out. We can provide a pathway, but we don't guarantee reassurance that you will have the job, right? Um, okay. Alisa, can I just give a few reminders to our audience? Uh, the, just letting you know that no one can guarantee you a job or a visa to Canada. So any person or agency making the guarantee or making such claim is likely fraudulent. And then we have mock job recruiters and fake recruitment agencies who are engaged in schemes and set up scams to entice immigrants. So if an offer is too good to be true, usually is, be careful about unsolicited job offers, and then you should treat them as scams or frauds. Now, students should remain vigilant with any unverified persons or organizations offering student visas and payment of money. Credentials of universities and colleges you wish to join, you should check it for authenticity. Okay, do your due diligence. Uh, do not involve in any unverified med middlemen in your dealings with such consultants because what's going on now, there's so many people out there inviting you to enroll in their school, but the school first, even if, if it's DLI, it is not post-grad work permit eligible, not PGWP eligible. So if it's not PGWP eligible, you won't be able to acquire for the PGWP. If you don't have a PGWP, you won't be able to acquire the work experience. So be very careful, please. Be very uh, uh, vigilant uh, and do your research and make sure that you're actually communicating with the actual representative before engaging uh, their services. Not the ghost one. Make sure that that representative is on the use of representative form. They declare that they have assisted you in the application. That's what Marjorie is referring to because we anyone can just like claim as representative, but they don't put their name on the application. So technically you are not being represented. And going back to Marjorie's point about the like job offers and like representing, just so you know, when you look for employment, you shouldn't be paying to find an employment. At the very first stage, if there is already an, uh, like transactions of payment, that is illegal. That is, if you are gonna be found uh, paying people to find an employment, uh, if the government would know that, that is considered misrepresentation. And just so you know, it's not the person who is going to be punished because that person is not reflected in the application. It's your application and it's your name that is uh, listed in the application. So once the government finds that out, you are the one who is responsible for that misrepresentation concern. So you have to address that concern to the government. So again, if anyone is offering you a job and, and they're asking for money, that is not legal. That is not allowed. You would only pay for an immigration application, meaning, um, you would only pay if you uh, like seek assistance from a representative who is processing your work permit, not the one providing you with employment. Okay. Good Any point, questions? Lisa. Thank you. Seven minutes left. Yeah. So um, for this one, it's regarding um, on Zoom, who will do the educational assessment? And do you have counterpart here in the Philippines. We're very interested to apply as immigrants. Uh, what would be the first step to do? Currently, we have a business here in the Philippines. Uh, they have uh, two kids in school, second year college in Antonio and one in grade 10 in an international school. Do you want to take that, Lisa? Because the question was, do you have a uh, an agency in the Philippines? And so all related to the experts okay. collective. Okay, so again, uh, this is the intention why we did the expert collective. We want to have like global networks. 
So we went out, we plan to register in the Philippines as an organization as well. So we could do the recruitment there. We could do like a lot of uh, events and help out people in coming to Canada. In terms of do we have counterpart in the Philippines again, right now as we speak, because that is not available for us yet, you don't need to have a counterpart anywhere. Because everyone, everything can be done online. Everything online. can be even. You are even attending this event while, while you're in the Philippines. <laughs> it means too that you can contact us online. So you can contact us. You can ask for help and how to to start off, uh, start up your uh, application. We get in terms of ECA, there is no um, ECE base in the Philippines. ECA meaning assessment, uh, educational credential assessment agency or designated organization to help you out with assessment. Nothing in the Philippines is only based in Canada, but we can help you out with applying for an SEA assessment or educational assessments. I hope that answers the, the question. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And um, they also follow up to that. What is the process for business or working immigration application? So the process, they said they've been in the business of almost 16 years in the Philippines, in advertising and there she uh the wife is an entrepreneur and the husband is an engineer so this i don't do market. business immigration i haven't done that okay so just so you know owner operator business application right now is already gone <clears throat> right now okay so <laughs> we need to do maybe it's if you have the money you need to tie up with a business owner in, the, in canada tie up first with them and invest with that owner. Because right now the owner operator Alamay A is not yet available or they they somehow, it's now under the regular stream LMA application. So tie up with a, a business owner in Canada and ask that owner to process an LMA A offer for you, like a job offer for you. Being maybe um, like as, as like manager, supervisor of the company. Okay, so maybe you can tie up. You can do, you can be a business visitor as well. You can start up um, a business in Canada and then explore the immigration pathways after all. You can be a vis business visitor. You can come to Canada and, and uh, maybe explore the business opportunities as a, like, as your startup, like initiative to you to, to start with a business. Alberta government, AINP has business pathways. Okay, but there are criteria to be met for you to be eligible. So when one of those criteria is if you are like, uh, you have just graduated foreign, foreign graduates or you have just graduated in Canada and plan to establish a business, you need to also have your like tie up with also in Alberta, they have like a designated agencies as well who deal with uh, like business plans that is acceptable by the Alberta government. So that is a very, there's so much things to, to discuss about the topic, about that matter, and it cannot just be uh, accommodated here because that is a specialized uh, program. I'd like to add something. Uh, you might want to consider uh, checking business immigration, business immigration stream from various Canadian provinces. Mm -hmm. So as Lisa said, in Alberta, we have a uh, self-employed farmer stream. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, for this category, you have to have the um, proof that you have farm farm management um, skills, okay? And then, of course, your uh, sufficient financial resources is uh, five hundred thousand dollars. You can also check Manitoba Entrepreneur Pathway. Um, they have the business Inver investor stream, uh, Entrepreneur Pathway in Manitoba in the province of Manitoba. You also, there's also a business category for under Saskatchewan Provincial Nominee Program. They have the entrepreneur category. And then uh, we move on to British Columbia. British Columbia also has the entrepreneur yes. immigration stream. Love, New Brunswick yes. also has its own New Brunswick business and immigration stream. Nova Scotia it also has it, uh, its own business immigration stream with uh, you need a net worth of at least $600,000 Canadian and be able to invest at least $150,000 Canadian. Um, Ontario, yes, Ontario also has its own uh, entrepreneur stream. And yeah, that's about it. Yes. So you might so, want to check the provincial nominee programs. Right. So again, uh, just to remind everyone that even if Canada, there's like IRCC, which is a federal 
uh, government or federal program, there are also provincial nomination programs. Okay, so we need to understand that. And again, we cannot discuss any further about that because that is like really very detailed information. There's already so much. I know even with this discussion, it's already confusing to everyone. It's so much to, to uh, like to take in. Absorb. Uh, absorb, it's so much. So if you have further questions specific to your situation, contact any one of us here. I am also seeing some of our colleagues. We have Mylene and we even have Chris here. We have like Ekaterina, they're specializing in some other streams as well. Ekaterina is doing like refugee application. Chris is doing a lot of Saskatchewan, Saskatchewan application. Mylene is also, I can see their names. So it's not only us here, like we're together, we support each other. And even if you are Joseph's like, contact joseph may come to marjorie or come to me or to anyone and we collaborate we work together so like it's not only one person doing the work for you we are here to help out uh, your situation okay so i think we need to wrap up now it's already 7 30 uh, there might still be a lot of questions and unless the moderator would allow us to extend or accommodate a few more questions uh, it's up to you, but again, with the experts, uh, I'm not sure whether you want, you're willing to accommodate more questions. We're already, because we set it up up to 7.30. Yes, there are still a few more questions. Maybe we can do one more. Um, and then if you still have any questions that were not answered, there was an email put in the Zoom chat box. So if you send it to that email, we'll try and get you an answer. But this last question is. Okay, hang on, Tommy, because I don't want to be. We don't want to overpromise. Over time. Okay. Right. Right. Um, we want to. We don't want to overpromise. I know there's a lot of questions, and somehow after this, uh, we might already be very busy because we have this. Uh, we set aside this commitment to be here and answer questions. So if you have like other questions, maybe you can book a consultation from any one of us, or again, we can wait for another event to respond to your questions. Because uh, we don't want to be saying that we're going to go back to you and then you're waiting and we are not doing what we are saying. So we, would, we don't want to be branded that we're not performing or doing what we like our word, the promises we have. We want to be as realistic as we can, as responsive as we can. So, so if, if you have those questions, we will consolidate those questions. And maybe the next time around for the next talk, we're going to address the common questions. Okay, maybe that sounds good for everyone. That sounds fair for everyone. And please go ahead with the last question, Tony. Okay, so our last question is, we have been denied for a student permit together with my family and are planning to apply for home child caregiver. Which one would be better for us as we wanted to fly as a whole family? Marjorie, I know you do. You do mm -hmm. Oh, things. okay. Uh, so you've been refused? So the, they've been refused, right? For, oh, okay. Um, study permit application. IRCCs refuse the letters, you know, they're vague, right? Especially with temporary residence applications. So you can request for access uh, to information or, or aid it. Now, if you're planning to resubmit an application, you have to go over all the documents submitted, up, update if you have to, address all the concerns of the officer or the reason of the officer in your resubmission, ref, refer to case laws that will apply to your application. But uh, remember, second application after a refusal, they're very difficult unless you can identify a clear error in the first application package or if it's possible to show that the applicant's circumstance has changed or is that new credible evidence to support the application is now available? Now, you, you, you mentioned about the home child care provider. So, so home child care provider pilot is closed. It was closed on January 17th. So the next intake will be next year. But if, that's, uh, if you want to go that route, uh, you have 11 months to prepare um, your English test, your uh, work experience requirement, uh, ability to perform the job, which is very important, your education credential evaluation assessment. But I have to be honest here that processing times has been longer as expected under the home child care provider pilot. You want to add, Joey, Lisa? Yeah, I just maybe a, a reminder that also the home child care provider, you really need the job offer. 
um yeah you have to secure that first before anything else i'm gonna make sure also that um uh, uh, i guess it, i'm not sure if they mentioned education but um, whoever's applying needs to um have an, um, an education assessment um and the canadian equivalency has to be at least one year and also english requirements and so on and so forth all right so takeaways <laughs> one more march and joey for takeaways just to wrap up our discussion um I know most of you maybe are in Canada, but I could not uh, emphasize more that why choose Canada, okay? Uh, Canada, because Canada embraces multiculturalism and they welcome immigrants. It's also one of the 10 largest economies in the world. Education system is world-class and most of all, Canada in, uh, Canadians enjoy access to universal healthcare. So don't lose your hope. Right, um, you should be here by now, or if not, you know, you work on that, you prepare, you plan, and then you prepare, and then we are here to to assist you. You you're not alone if you're not familiar with the process, as I mentioned earlier. Again, thank you very much, guys, for joining us tonight. Magandang gabi po, maayong gabi kung na mga taga bisaya, and to Expert Collective, thank you very much to the staff. Good job. Well done. Awesome. Take away, Joey. Yeah. So again, thank you everyone for um, being here in this webinar. I hope you were able to, to get a lot of valuable information. I know it's, I don't think it was enough time to, for us to really, <laughs> we, we, we love sharing lots of details. That's our job. <laughs> but I guess the time constraint, um, we had to keep it really, um, what do you call this? very brief as much as possible, but we'd love to share. Um, and we'd love uh, for an, anyone um, which have, um, among us or any other colleagues here at the Expert Collective, uh, we'd appreciate if you'd reach out to us, we'd be happy to help and um, do a consultation, meet you online or in person if you're in Canada and um, um, set everyone up for, for success to come here. So for me, I would like to rec request everyone to spread the word tech, the expert collective. So with tech, you will only, you will get the right person who could provide you with the right advice, the proper advice, sound advice. So please don't go anywhere if you do not know that they are licensed. Only hire a regulated person for you to assist you with your immigration application whether you also need other services, not just immigration, if you are already here in Canada, because I see uh, some other people that are already here, um, also seek advice from like the licensed people as well. You know what kind of the life is all about, so approach the right people. So that's all I can say, and please spread the word tech so that we can have more engagement and more audience next time and we can we can help out with like we can help out everyone not to be victimized by um illegal recruitment and illegal assistance so thank you everyone uh the uh, our moderators and our hosts are still going to say something but i just want to take this opportunity to thank them we can't do it without you guys it's been a long-term plan a long a plan for a long the longest time but we can't do it because we're very busy, but with your help, with your support, we're able to materialize it. So thank you very much. Thank you guys again so much for all your time experts for educating us about what you know on immigration. Um, and that's just all for tonight's webinar. If you guys uh, still have anything to promote like your social medias, uh, we can put it in the chat if you'd like um and Tommy if you have anything to add no I'm just gonna echo what you said it's been such um it's been very informative and so I thank you for sharing your experience um also just wanted to let you know for everyone who attended that we'll be sending a feedback form after the event and so we're hoping that you could answer it to help us improve our future webinars. 
because like Lisa said, it's been a long time coming for this one, but we hope to host more in the future. So this would be helpful for that. Thank you. Bye. Be safe, everyone. Thank you. Have Bye, a nice everyone. weekend. Bye. Thank you, Marge, and thank you, Joey. Thank you. Bye. Welcome. You thank again. you as well. Bye. Thanks for having us. I hope to see you in person, Joseph. Yes, Next very soon. In Calgary. <laughs> very soon, <simple. laughs> Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.